So let me go ahead and, and uh, introduce um, David Walmroth. He's a University of Michigan graduate and has extensive experience in project management, especially in IT operations management. In his free time, he loves doing autonomous RC racing. Um, so he uh, attends 96 Boards Open Hours, which is a community around ARM controllers for Thomas RC development. And he has won awards for Bot and Bike, which is a bicycle design build competition and ARM Hackster Autonomous Robot Challenge and Hackfest 17 Chop Till You Drop. So welcome, David. Thanks so much for giving this talk. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, like I said in advance, I, so I just kind of I had a difficult run up through some slides together. We'll walk through them and then hopefully the actual Jupyter uh, notebooks will co uh, cooperate and then we can see the car actually do some, at least spin some wheels and then I can show you a short video of what it looks like in action. So at a very high level, I kind of wanted to come down to this subject through the full-size autonomous vehicles and you guys have probably all heard of the different levels of autonomy and so on and so forth i'm not going to dwell on that we don't care about that in the racing context but that's usually what people tend to focus on whereas in our world and what is my screen not going to the next slide just a moment ago yes Try and come out of this. Hmm. We walked down the first slide all of a sudden. How about that? Drums? Let me. Um, Can I ask a question about this slide? Sure. Um, where do you think that some of these um, companies are in the in the levels of of offering currently, like? Uh, the, is it three or four or two for um, like Musk is, what's his, now I got a mental block, Elon Musk, uh, the Tesla. Yeah, um, I, you know, where I would place them is, I mean, certainly nobody's at five. Uh, I think there's some three slash fours. It kind of depends mm -hmm. a little bit how you interpret the manufacturer's statements and definitions. You know, everybody's pretty decent at driving along a highway and doing lane assist and, and this sort of thing. And everybody has issues when it comes to other situations, be it inclement weather or some challenging road situations and this kind of thing. So I would kind of put everybody in the three or four, somewhere between two and four, I guess I'd say. The fours, when you when you kind of do a different construct, geofencing, um, you know, where you're in a very controlled area and you've got a, a different, you know, like a sensor network that's might possibly street sign based or telephone pole based, like May Mobility started in the Detroit area. It's it's a little bit cheating, but you could certainly get in that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, to use the term very loosely, but you can certainly board that vehicle and whatever is going on, whether traffic wise, it knows that geofence, that limited route super well. And it would, you know, be close to what I would call a level five capable, mm -hmm. but in a small operating area. So thanks. That's yeah. interesting to hear that. At least that's my take. And everything here is just kind of my take from watching and attending and digesting and meeting and studying and so forth. So for us, and what I find intriguing about the autonomous vehicle space is it translates not just to full-size autonomous vehicles, which is kind of like, you know, the moonshot, the high watermark, but smaller vehicles and most definitely robots that'll operate in different kinds of semi-public situations. So these core components even of an autonomous vehicle apply also to smaller scale autonomous robots that might do delivery or what have you. So it's not just all about the road and full size, it's all sizes. And what it generally comes down to is four basic kind of things that the car has to, has to worry about or any autonomous mobile device has to worry about. And they call it perception, localization, planning and control. And so for perception in this, we get neural networks and things, but it's basically, it's just what's going on in the environment. Is there a pedestrian? Is there something in my way? Um, these sorts of things, call it situational awareness. 
localization is when you get into maps or how you decide to map your way around that, that you know where you are. The planning component is you're, you're going to decide you know, where you're going to construct this route. Is it a bunch of waypoints and, and, and so on and so forth? Is it a vision based system? And then lastly, the actual physical levels, the control of the vehicle which generally in, in an autonomous mobile bot or car is really, there's a lot going on, but you're giving back steering, throttle or gas or speed and uh, brakes. And that's pretty much about it, uh, at least at this juncture. So some of the devices that you use to achieve these things. So on the perception side for either a two dimensional or three dimensional world, you have LIDARs usually pretty expensive items if you get into the 3D, 360 kind of arena. Um, Vision-based systems, cameras that can range from low-end Raspberry Pi cameras all the way up to you know, much more expensive depth sensing cameras like the Intel D435 or T265. Um, and then naturally also things like radar or ultrasonic sensors in a smaller case. Radar much more so for the bigger vehicles. It's not something we get involved with, but it's a sensor that you'll often see mounted also on the cars. For the localization side, you can do camera-based localization. You can use a LiDAR point cloud to localize. You can use geographic uh, satellite triangulation, you know, i.e. GPS. That one only gives you about 50 centimeters. If you want to get down to one centimeter precision, you have to add a little thing called RTK, which is another little side story. It involves also adding an antenna, but it's very doable. Um, for the planning, deciding on what routes you're going to take, that's your compute stack, however you're doing it. It's as simple as, could be as simple as following a line or something much more complex based on some sort of map, Google Maps or whatever kind of map you might have or your point cloud or whatever. But that kind of depends on what algorithms and how you're approaching that particular mobility challenge. And then lastly, you're giving off controls to the car. So are you going through the CAN bus? Are you going through an ESC? You're going out the pins on your developer board, whatever it is. But those are the ways, the, the interfaces that you have to talk to the controllers that change the speed and the braking and the steering. And so when you look at just about every single autonomous vehicle out there on the road, you can see starting on the bottom, there's sort of like, and I'm not 100% sure which, whose sensors these are, but on the bottom, you've probably got your radar there on the front bumper, maybe some cameras, maybe some ultrasonic sound sensors. The center circle, you can kind of see the camera, the forward facing camera peeking out. And then on the top, and you'll recognize them all the time, there's a puck up there, which is which is your LIDAR. Um, it's a little difficult to see. I should have drawn one more circle. There's kind of a pan over here, I believe on the left, which is your GPS uh, receiver. So that's the other thing you'll usually see, but you just mixes of these components, some people more camera based, some more LIDAR based, some will put multiple LIDARs on there, some just one, but you'll see some sort of mix of generally the same uh, sensor stack. Um, and so kind of segueing a little bit more into the racing world. So on the full size racing vehicle scene right now, there's really only two and two kind of leaders. And it's so new that it's it, nothing's really been established. And so on the one hand, you have an organization called Robo Race, which is, this is one of their uh, racing vehicles. It's factory sponsored. So you had at least originally like Intel had a car, NVIDIA had a car and so on and so forth. They are now, they've done a few races, but nothing, you know, too regular or too major. They've had a lot of issues. It, it's complicated when you're talking full size and full speed. They're doing something, I don't know if this is going to work, but they're all so branching into what they call a metaverse kind of environment where they're bringing in like comic books, animation characters going with the car and, and so on and so forth. I don't know how that's gonna end up buffing out, but that's Robo Race. On the other side, and, and again, very much kind of just corporate, not something where a, a community can engage or anything like that, kind of a little tech demonstration and possibly even, hopefully none of them are on the line, but maybe floundering a little bit. On the other hand, the India Autonomous Challenge, 
was involved, I believe, some 30 odd colleges, universities around the world. It's been going on for, I think, over two years with various qualifications. But this year in the fall, they're going to run at the Indianapolis 500 um, custom cars. This is called, a, I believe it's a Delara something, but you'll see there's really no space where the driver cockpit is. That's all occupied with technology on the vehicle on the right. Um, and two days ago, what the teams have had to do is go through simulation of, of all of their code. So you have uh, the ANSYS simulator, which is auto industry high-end simulation environment. The teams have been working in that simulator on the simulated track of the Indy course. And they, you know, the plan is to run around 180 miles per hour. Um, and a couple teams have qualified this last weekend was one of those qualifying events. And a team from Italy and in Munich took the one and two spots, but so that will be happening in the fall. Um, What's interesting there is some of those teams will actually use components of an open software, open source driving stack called AutoWare. So, and just to kind of take a micro step back in this world of autonomy, you know, be you Ford or GM or whatever, Tesla, there are different thrusts, uh, some more internal development focus, some more outsource focus. You can buy an autonomous driving stack from NVIDIA. Um, and so there's there's lots of um, variations in that in that whole overall sort of space. But as we kind of go down into the smaller world, more accessible world, uh, there's a couple of different major organizations. And one of them in the upper left is called Ducky Town, which uses a much smaller um, tech platform than some of the other cars, much slower, but also much more geared towards. Um, intelligent driving. They also sponsor what's called the Intelligent Driving Olympics. Um, it's a very interesting, relatively low barrier to entry um, way to get into all of this stuff. Um, then next over, what we'll take a look at in a second, NVIDIA also has an open source setup for the what they call the Jet Racer. Um, uses the neural network that basically does interactive regression. That's one way to approach the task. A little bit different from Donkey Car or DIY Robocars, which is a very big organization or, or at least community. It's all just community based, but out of California. Um, lots of members from around the world there. They do regular races at quarterly races at Circuit Launch, which is in the Bay, um, some sort of like, you know, tech incubator. Um, and um, Lots going on in that community because it's a low barrier to entry because most people don't use LIDAR. It's a vision-based system. And so things like reinforcement learning, which we won't really get into, but long story short, having the car learn to drive better or faster by itself, going through iterative loops and getting rewards and, and, and things like that. You see a lot of that in the donkey car community. Um, there's also in the lower left F1 10th which are, again, some of the people that are using AutoWare is getting ported to this environment. It's a one-tenth scale car, um, even though technically it's a one-fifth scale car. But this is more of a university also oriented thing because this car, if you look at the bill of materials for F110, it's between three and $4,000, um, at least 1,500 of, of it being that LiDAR alone. And in this case, this is a 2D LiDAR that they have on there which you can do as good as better with, with a vision-based system. But it's uh, interesting and they spell out the, um, you know, how to build the car and, and the, all of the technology involved. And they're going to be porting AutoWare down to that, um, in which, like I said, is also in use some of the Indy Challenge teams. So that's a really super powerful kind of driving stack software that you know things like recognizing pedestrians and stop signs and and lights and different times of types of lights and so on and, and interfacing right with your obd or your can bus on a full-size vehicle if you want that's a super um rich environment for those sorts of things a lot of those things you absolutely don't need in a racing context because you don't have to worry about a lot of those traffic type situations um but Still, it's interesting to know that you can bring a, a, a potent software stack like that down to these smaller levels. And then you got on the right to Amazon. Amazon has also jumped into the game with the AWS Racer. Um, I have not seen these in person. They've been around for over a year now. They 
don't tend to you know race a lot they have sort of they they show up and then they set up their track on the side and just do kind of their thing it's a reinforcement learning based approach which is neat but it's also um got a lot of closed source components but i added them here because it's Though it's a very small kind of thing, I mean, you see a big player like Amazon also getting involved in the space. This is an example of a track. This is the latest track at Circuit Launch in California. So you can kind of see, you know, the nature. This is this is a rather haphazardly made track. <laughs> I don't care for it. It's going to lead to problems. You should not have a circle like that in the middle where traffic crosses. That's going to lead to some some unhappy participants. But it is what it is. It's just an example of one of these things. This is a track that we came up with, and Central Coast Autonomous Racing was also just the the C Car Association was also just a name we've been playing with. But the goal here is also to be able to run a little bit faster. And so this is roughly the size of a basketball court. But when you look at this kind of a sweeping turn like we have, now you can start talking about hitting, you know, some more substantial speeds or just showing what, what the algorithm looks like under really quick circumstances. Um, so kind of segueing a little bit more into the car, the standard, any standard RC chassis will basically work for these kind of exercises with varying pluses and minuses, but at a minimum, you can get it done on that basis. And if people are kind of not familiar with RC chassis, they're super duper really basic. There's not a lot of variation. There's not a lot of stuff going on there. There's basically just like, and you can see on the bottom, we have a battery. Um, then you have a, a simple servo motor that turns your front wheels. It just goes back and forth, back and forth. And then for your controlling of the motor, you need with an ESC or electronic speed controller. So forward, reverse, braking, all of those really specific control commands generally unique to that particular motor. ESC handles all of that stuff for you. So you don't have to worry about it. And then you've got just your a particular type of motor. You can have a brush DC motor, a brushless motor, a censored motor. Uh, you could have a motor on each wheel if you want for more of a robot construct. You know, all variations are open. Um, this is a little bit of a blown up view of the F110th.org world. Again, the expensive one, you don't have to use the LiDAR. But what's interesting here, and I just wanted to make this side note, is that this is also where ROS, the robot operating system, comes into the picture. That's what AutoWare is based on. They're using it here. It's kind of a pain in the ass. I'm still kind of getting to know it, but uh, it's really, really useful if you want to talk about having different systems communicate with each other and broadcast and receive messages. And it also translates 100% into the whole robotics world. So like we're doing in our group, we're not racing as a mechanism to learn the technology and then deploy it to other hopefully monetizable initiatives like agricultural bots, delivery bots, and so on and so forth. And the neat thing about Ross is if you have your LIDAR working um, and your code working and path following and everything, it's real easy to shift from platform to platform and control different kinds of motors and things like that. There's a huge Ross community out there as well. Um, Okay, so I press down and okay. So that okay, perfect. So that's the tail end of that. Let me um, close this out. We won't be needing this anymore. And then let's take a look at. That racer, which we'll examine in a little bit more detail here. Come on. There we go. Okay. So this, and like I said, we're going to just look at the NVIDIA flavor of of uh, a one ten scale autonomous um, learning environment. It's very approachable. Um, pretty very straightforward. Comes with Jupyter notebooks. Probably one of the easier ones to get in and get going. So you can see in this particular case, yeah, he's on the track, he's on the carpet. Let me then briefly look at hardware and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at software. So I used a different chassis um, in my case. This is just a regular one-tenth uh, streetcar 
type chassis, very similar to the Tamiya that you see in the in the picture here. So if you take a look at what's involved with that, let me go to the hardware. Is this okay, Dan, by the way, so far, the flow and whatnot? You guys all okay? Yeah, we're good. I think on the um, on your shared screen, we still see the PowerPoint. Oh yeah, okay. Let me just stop and restart then with this one. How's that? Can you see it now? Um, yeah, we see the we see GitHub now. Yeah. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, okay. So yeah, this is the main page for the NVIDIA, the artificial intelligence internet of things. They kind of plugged it underneath there, but that's where the GitHub repo is. And we will take a look at the hardware. You can see here also, they have a total build cost estimate of $600 on that car. Um, it's a, you know, depending on what chassis you use, and you can see 400 for the 1 8th, 18th scale, um, you, can, you can get that price down uh, even more. And so before we, yeah, here's what I wanted to look at just briefly. I should say also, Nvidia has a thing called Jetbot because um, you guys mentioned some of the some of the children here. Jetbot is also very interesting. Smaller form factor um, comes with its own motor controller, so you don't have to deal with all that stuff. It's not made for racing as such, but to use AI, follow the path, follow a person, object detection, Jetbot is is very useful for that. Um, so very quickly here. You have the standard chassis. You make a second level to hold your tech and whatnot. We don't have to get into all of this stuff. Let's see, here we go. There's this, and yeah, I should point out on the hardware side of the equation, whether you're using a Raspberry Pi for donkey car um, or most of the people that use Jet Racer, um, we'll use an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is a super inexpensive $100 for the four gigabyte or, or $80, I think, for the four gigabyte version, which I highly recommend. I think $49 or $59 for the two gigabyte version that you can start to play with. But so they you mount the Nano, you mount the camera, you add these. So basically, here you've got a, a Jetson Nano. The wireless card fits in here. You've got the antennas coming out. Those things, as you see here in the picture, really straightforward. You just put all that in place, attach the antennas, attach the servo controllers, and we'll look at all this stuff in a second. But everything is very straightforward. You can see how it how it all comes together fairly simply. I'll just show that on this one too. Okay, so this guy is still considered, this is a Traxxas slash body. It's considered a one-tenth scale car if you're talking about short, short bed trucks or sh short truck, short track trucks, I believe they call it. Technically speaking, this, which is much smaller, is a more common like one-tenth scale chassis. So this, even though it call, it's considered a one-tenth scale short truck, if this was a, a road car like this, this would be already one-fifth scale. You can fit a nano onto one of these, but now, and also as you sign the bill of materials for some of the other cars, they want you to go with the next step up from a nano, which is now, a, it's called a Xavier NX. So whereas a nano is under 100, Xavier NX is around 400. But ton more processing power and all of those sorts of things. 
Um, and that's where having a bigger chassis is a nice thing. Um, not only can you now like start to go across the grass or I was testing this in a greenhouse at a farm recently, um, you can go off road, you can go in different kinds of elements, but you can stack your tech on top of here. So if you wanted to put a, another object detection or, or pose as, or just different kinds of AI, you have plenty of room to, to put your battery power and the rest of your, your equipment and so on and so forth. So I think, let me up here, yeah. And this, and you can see here, very basic body, 3D printed uh, little board to go on top and all of the tech mounted on top of that, which is exactly what we have here. And if you look at some of the parts, the, I don't know if you can see it, but the servo controller, which is right here, is exactly the one that they have in the picture. Then there's a little multiplexer over here, also right behind that antenna, that little square is right there. Camera on front, exactly like they have in the picture. So it's you're really only adding a couple of items. It's not a complex exercise. So let us then... With that said, so good so far. I'm gonna kind of segue into the software now. Any questions? Are you guys okay? Still, still, still all right? Yeah, we had a couple of questions from Charlie, David. Um, how much time would it take to build like a working car? Once you know what you're doing, a, a morning to an afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't, about a week. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, if you have the pieces there and all that stuff, you can get easy, easy a morning. To, to get out and to build the car, you know, maybe a couple hours um, if, for the first time when you do it your first time, several hours, but but nothing, you know, from from if your car is already together, then then, you know, really like a morning to, to get the hardware all together at, at most if you're good at it under an hour for sure. And then Steve Fandy asked um, what is spinning in the middle is that the heat sink fan. Yep, that's a fan on top of the Nano. Um, that is a heatsink fan. Thanks for that. Let's go back. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I, I'm a little unclear whether you download a program to the car and then it does everything automatically or do you interact with it while it's on the track, like with a joystick controller or, or something else? Yep, that's a good question. So both is the, is the answer. The way it starts, first thing you do once you've got the hardware on board is you um, uh, burn an SD card or etch an image on an SD card. And that, that image is available from NVIDIA. It's on this repo as well. And you download that image onto your SD card. And then you put the SD card in the Nano and boot it up and go through a, a series of software instructions to basically get connectivity. And then you go into the software that we'll see here in a second and um, uh, start to do your actual tuning and coding and all of that stuff. So for example, and I guess I can, do we have any more questions? So when the car is running, I mean, it's on the track, it's racing, it's doing it all by itself. You're not driving it or accelerating it or braking it. It's doing everything autonomously. You, you It's all hands off once it's once the race has started, correct? Yep, exactly. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank yep. you. Yep. So, um, and let me, since I didn't seem to be able to, so we didn't just switch to Jupiter Lab, did we? Or can you see the code now? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so let us now see. So having now, at least in theory, you know, we created our SD card on our laptop. We took it out of our laptop. We put it into the Nano. We fired up the Nano. We did the, made sure the Wi-Fi connectivity is there. That's another little sidestep. But now that all that's done, we're technically ready to go into the first. These are the, the notebooks. And uh, you don't have all this clutter in here. This is just me doing a bunch of different things. But you, you start with basic motion, which is this first notebook. And so now that the car is connected, I can go basically here and... 
execute that block of code and it has now done that, done this initial initiation, uh, initialization and, and so on and so forth. And so now you should be able to see, oh, sorry, I gotta power up the car as well. Um, I use, for my purposes, a regular RC controller. You can use a joystick for this. Um, I think you have more control with an RC controller, but you can use either one. So let me, um, Power everybody up here. There'll be no sparks. Okay. So as you can see, like right now, I can turn the wheels with the controller. Standard, standard kind of stuff. I can spin the back tires also with the controller. So now that we've executed this first line of code to kind of get the car registered, if I go here, change the steering, I have to flip the car over into autonomous mode. So now I can control it. And now I can't. And now it's being controlled by the system. So you should see the front wheels move a little bit here when I execute this block. So were you able to see that? It's kind of subtle. Let me go back to And if I go back. Yes, I, we saw it. Okay, great. So that's that you can see now you've got control to the car. Um, I am connected to the IP address of the Nano through the laptop right now. And so if we go past, and I'm just going to kind of walk through these things. I'm not going to get into the steering gain and offset, but this is where it kind of does get interesting if you want to kind of start to tune your car, um, which is a whole other thing. And now I should be able to, and this is, so this car is set up. We want to put together a race here in the Detroit area to get basically back on the map. California is dealing the show. We really need to up the visibility, I think, here in the Detroit area of what the industry is capable of. So for starters, we wanted to make something here that was much faster than what they're doing in California and start to push the speed envelope a little bit. And so this is a little bit of a hokey high-end motor, but let me see. Okay, so if I go here. Should be getting some wheel spin here, but I'm not for some reason. Oh, um, let's try something here. This thing might rock it out on me. So I'm gonna, there we go. All right, so that's way too fast. There we go. So <laughs> this is where you also kind of dial in your throttle, you know, and how fast you want it to go in the demos and so on and so forth. So with these basic parameters set, then you move on. From there you would move on to the next step, which is um, interactive regression, which is where you're starting to train a model. So now, sometimes this takes a few moments, might have to reboot, okay, perfect. So now I've loaded, in this case, I'm using the CSI camera, which goes into the nano through the, through the MIPI port. You could also do a USB camera, or if you want to get more advanced like this, you can use a Intel RealSense depth sensing camera. For, for some other activities. I haven't really got deeply into that yet, but it's there. You can put all sorts of different cameras on there. That executed. 
There we go. Okay, so now you see my kind of uh, getting a lot of delay, but you do see there an image. There we go. It's it's, it's there's a lag side. So in my haste, because my track is in the garage here and it's covered with bicycles and otherwise, I just you know drew a little something on the wall so you kind of I got my dimensions off obviously, but you get the idea. So now what you would start to do is build a data set. So imagine this is basically on the lane on the ground that you want to follow. And I would literally start to point where, um, where I want the car to go. And it will collect, it's kind of laggy right now, but it will put basically a point here, like we saw in the demonstration. And then what you do is you move the car along with whatever kind of control you have. There you go. You can see that yellow circle. So all in this case, in Jet Racer's case, it's a 100% vision-based system. So I'm just telling it on every image where it should go. And if it's a turn, you're going to put this circle over to the left. Um, right turn, hard right turn. If you're going off the track, you, you just move it where you want the car to go. And then the neural network picks all of that up and trains a model that looks at the actual images coming in, maps those to whatever you gave it here, and then we'll try and basically drive around um, the path. So there's also a few things that you can do to interactively tune the model. I'm not gonna get into that now because um, essentially, I, because we're a limited budget operation or no budget operation, we don't have access to big GPUs to train the model so it can take a good amount of time on a small development board like this to actually have it train your AI model. Um, but it does a decent enough job. So you're talking about like for a small track and we'll, I'll show you a clip here of it actually going around the track in a second. Training that model probably took, yeah, the computer probably ran for close to an hour, which isn't that bad. It was, it's not a, that complicated a model either. Um, so that's what you're doing here and then what it also offers you the ability to do, and I, again, I'm not gonna activate it because we're not testing the model here, um, is you can tune a little bit further down in the code, it'll come back and say, with a blue dot, it'll say, okay, this is where I'm going to go, is that right? And so then you can correct it and move the dot around and sort of dial in exactly where you want it to go. So with that, let me see. Um, Okay, uh, can you see this screen? Is there like a controller? Did it flip over? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let me just run this. So this is in the basement behind and the garage here behind where I'm standing. This was the previous chassis. That's, that's basically this car running with, with the same gear here. I literally took this off and put it on there with a different, this happens to be this. We were doing some things with arm at the time. So it happens to be this body, standard one tenth body. But then you'll see me flip the controller off here and then you'll just see at a certain speed, you know, what the car is doing. So let's see if this works. So it, I'm sure somebody, you, the astute viewers, heard it bump the wall a few times there. So that's what happens. It'll, it's still trying to adjust as it goes around, and then it found a different line and, and wasn't bumping into the wall. But that was more just a kind of a fluke as to where it was seeing itself. I could have added, and it would be a nice project to add some little, very inexpensive couple dollar ultrasonic sensors on, say, the sides. 
and then I, you know, you could have corrected because there was literally an object there. Or had I been using a LIDAR, a 2D LIDAR, for example, would have caught that. So there's different ways around that. The other interesting thing is in the video, you'll see I was trying to train the car. I was going outside of the blue lines on purpose because I was starting to try and get a little bit faster circuit going. So I was trying to approach what we call the race line. Um, but I certainly could have trained it to stay in between the lines. The lines are nothing but reference points. I could take these lines completely away and, and, and just keep pointing that camera angle, say using these boxes that it, that it likes to have for reference. So it doesn't care about lines. It's just going wherever you put it on the screen, which when you're say doing, if you're going to use this approach to drive around an agricultural setting or around a greenhouse, is, is fine too. You know, it just doesn't care about lines. It just cares about the image. It will leverage the lines in the neural network as an additional clue to where it should be going, but it certainly doesn't have to have the lines. Um, so I think I, uh, I've covered as much little sub areas we could go into, but that was kind of the high level thing. You know, we've got some time for questions. Now, I'd, I'd love to say, oh, I didn't mention, I also, I'm one of the organizers of the Ann Arbor Autonomous Vehicle Group. We used, there's a big Detroit group as well. We used to meet at Washington Community College, and then we were meeting a little bit north here in, in the Dexter area where we have access to a track. Um, but we're kind of shopping, and especially now for this, which is going to be a much more high speed exercise, we're really looking for a track um to, to test and start to build the models at a higher tra level track and so for us now that meant like m city is a possibility the american center for mobility is a possibility we had some conversations with them um kettering university in flint has a perfect setup they seem to be more flexible than the first two so that i think that might be a direction that we're leaning in but recently we got a call asking that we do a demonstration at um, Lawrence Tech. I don't know what they have there. You know, a big parking lot will do for us, but um, it'd be nice to have something with a little bit more of a, a path or some lanes where we can, you know, run at these high speeds. And we're looking for, traditionally in the donkey car races, I don't know if they even, if they, you know, it's 10, 15 miles per hour or whatever. There are two guys in California that are fast. Everybody else is super slow. The two fast guys, their cars are, are capable of more than the track will hold. Um, and so that's why we also kind of want to have an event here in the fall where some of our friends from Germany and Italy would probably come over, maybe the Californians as well. But that would be, you know, something with a little bit more high speed so that you could see what these cars are capable of. Um, so if anybody's interested in this stuff, I encourage you to, you know, reach out to me directly either through the Ann Arbor Autonomous Vehicle Group or whatever. We've been sort of still a little bit silent on that just because they're playing with their projects. Um, but, you know, do get in touch if you want to put something together. We've started working with a little bit with Square One Educational Network, which is in many high schools in Michigan. They have a whole vehicle light waiting and so on and so forth. Um, high speed autonomous, not high speed autonomous, but a high speed vehicle. They use this chassis. This was, in fact, a donor from them um, to, to us for us to show them how they could kind of incorporate, or for me to show them how they could incorporate autonomous into the into the program. And then just one last comment, and this 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 guy is what's left over, or the current version of what was our tomato bot, which won that award. But the cool, cool thing about that is that this one is a skid steer. So this isn't you know, driven by servo. This has four motors on each, a motor on each wheel, more of a classic robot. But you can use the same, if I'm gonna drive this around, I could drive this around the track just as easily I could drive another one. This one, like I said, we wanna do some greenhouse type stuff with it. But your code essentially you know, can be ported right over, especially in the Ross world. And there's tons of code in the Ross world already to run these sorts of things. So with that, Dan, did I leave any gaps or additional questions, thoughts? So, so these kids want to get a car and come out? So we do another little Zoom call, put your cars together? I'm open.
We did have yeah. a couple more questions online. Um, Tom was asking if the races are always against time or are they, or yeah, are they one car at a time or do they ever have the cars kind of race head to head? So race management, and this is, this whole world is in its infancy. Race management is also in its infancy. So in F110, they race, I believe, two cars. I, we raced in F110, but it was in the winter during, in the simulator. Um, donkey car will also race two cars. They'll crash. They'll bump each other off. Nobody really has a good outdoor passing algorithm or any of that stuff down just yet. So it really, it tends to kind of come down to, they'll put two cars on the track at a time, but both cars are really just trying to get around the track as quickly as they can. They don't care about the other car. If, if, if the other car is in their way, they'll, most of them will just crash into it, unfortunately. And, and this is where we wanna also here in the Detroit area, take it up a notch by teaching the cars to pass and all this sort of thing. But yeah, traditionally it's a time trial. You're looking for who kind of got around the track and it's different at each rent, it, it, depending on who's organizing it. But traditionally you wanna just see who made it around the track the fastest and they'll put two cars on the track at the same time. Mostly those cars don't know of each other. Okay, thanks for that. Is there any other questions? I think Mansoor said he was interested in getting involved. So you have some interest uh, from that. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mansoor, sorry. I'm sorry about this, I didn't interrupt you. Yep, I'm interested actually, I'm, I'm really beginner to this stuff. I wanna get actually some guidance from you if there is something I can join in the uh, groups, I would really, add, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, so on Meetup, the Ann Arbor Autonomous Vehicle Meetup group, as like I said, there hasn't been much posting there in the last year with the pandemic and all, but you can reach out to me, David Walmroth. I'm one of the co-organizers there, or um, Dan, you can, uh, I guess I could do it in chat, so just david.walmroth at gmail.com. Maybe you could post there, I can. I can actually, put, I can leave my, my email address here if I appreciate if you can actually reach mm -hmm. back. Me, I just get with some. Yeah, great. Sure. I really appreciate David. Thanks a lot. Any other questions for David? I had a quick question. I wanted to know: um, Are you looking for pristine parking lots, or are you able to race in fields? Or because you know, certain places come to mind for me, uh, like the Washtenaw County Fairgrounds. I don't know if that would be a, a useful spot or or not you know, depending upon the timing, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll look at anything, the more, so for, for the street racing, you know, there you, yeah, a parking lot will do, but it should be in decent, decent order because the cars, a lot of the cars don't have much, much clearance. Um, the, 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 the road, the touring cars as they're called. Um, generally though, we can work with any kind of open area. The, um, Washtenaw County Fairgrounds is a little, is kind of intriguing. I haven't been out there, but I've been told that someone in the RC community actually has an off-road RC track there. And off-road changes is, is a whole nother kettle of fish. Um, much, <laughs> much more challenging. <laughs> you know, I think it's much more interesting. I think it's it's a place where we need to look in this area um, because we have a lot of off-road and agricultural and, and different things like that. So in that scenario, then, you know, fields can, can work. Um, and the nice thing about fields is when the car goes tumbling, you know, it's not quite as, as, as big a deal as when they go flying on the parking lot mm -hmm. or, or inside. So that's like, super duper new that's one of the reasons i built on the chassis that i built on here is to start investigating that off-road space we were thinking actually of going to uh a heinz dry uh, the heinz park i believe has an off-road rc track as well i've never seen it but yeah, i was about to mention that david there's like yeah in livonia there's like an rc track with jumps and stuff <laughs> that's available yeah. for everyone it's pretty cool yeah yeah i i and we've been you know I don't know much of the RC community around town. I think I, you know, we've had some brushes. Sometimes I think they can be a little sensitive. It's a different sort of thing. Um, like when we need to train the models, you, you can't have, you know, 
dozens of cars ripping around you all the time and, and, and stuff when you're trying to figure out the track, yada, yada, yada. But it's certainly the kind of tracks one could make use of in, you know, at different times. And, um, uh, you know, jumping as an example, it just opens up a, a whole nother thing of like where your LIDAR and where your camera are looking. I think it's a, it's a wonderful area to start to explore because that's where you can really, you know, to me in the autonomous space, so autonomous mobility, mobility the bots, the thing, the autonomous wheelbarrow, the guy that's the autonomous thing that's cutting your lawn, the Roomba that's vacuuming your, 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 your house, those, that's where, you know, short kind of delivery robots, that's going to be the big mobility explosion and then adding sensors and, and 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 actuators or arms to those mobile things so they can do even more carry help you put it in the shelf or whatever it is so that's kind of like the i, I think in a lot of ways the big space but from a, um, a general like driving sort of thing off-road is just uh, you know the, the challenge and just a really exciting space Any other questions for David? I have a question. Uh, there's a question also in the list from Toby. Do you want to go ahead, uh, John, and then we'll then okay. I'll. Uh... So David, you were saying that the car has a camera on it, mm -hmm. and the camera looks ahead, and then based on what it sees, it does calculations and turns or goes straight or brakes or accelerates or whatever. So can you as a programmer see what the car sees while it's racing? Is there yeah. a way for yeah. you to see yeah. what the car sees? And yeah. is that normal or is that just like a troubleshooting thing or, or when it's uh, racing, will you normally do that? You, you, so what it does with what it's, ironically, what it does with what it sees is it gets rid of just about everything that you see and looks for hard edges to align uh -huh. itself to. So it takes the color out as the, well, depending on which algorithm you're using, right? But for Jet Racer, it takes the color out, it dumbs it down, and it looks for straight lines and edges and things like that to, to recognize its path. So you can see, I can, I can have a live feed of exactly what the camera's seeing, if I so choose. I can also have a live stream of what the computer is seeing. So the, the um, modified image that mm. it's literally digesting as well. Got it. Yep. All right. yep, thank you. And you can do the same with, well, I mean, you do do the same with LIDAR too. You know, the LIDAR, you get yourself a point cloud map and then you can see when you fire your LIDAR up exactly, you know, what it's seeing live in the LIDAR case, which is a little different. Um, it's just localizing based on, I think, three or four points in that in that cloud. Great, thank you. So uh, Toby also had a question. Has anything been done with more connectivity between the cars, such as ITS? That's another, you know, area, and that's what I meant to mention before I kind of got sidetracked, but the, the inter-car communication or inter-bot communication is huge, and nobody's done anything uh, in these fledgling racing circuits on that front yet. Um, mesh networks and, and, again, communicating things back and forth between a, um, a, a fleet of bots, huge stuff, communicating even with fixed things that are out there if you're driving by a store whatever it is huge space haven't seen anybody do it um yet it, it's definitely all very very doable you know the technology that you can get if you want to run a laura wan like network at low speeds just to send certain information or whatever um you know first person view videos and so on and so forth what i wanted to say before about why i also think off-road is kind of cool is especially when you have either four-wheel drive with one motor controlling four wheels, or if you have four separate type motors, you can, when you have a car in a certain attitude, if you can spin those motors individually, you can control that car's attitude in the air. And, and that, and, or, or when it gets, you know, hairy around a turn, you can make decisions much more quickly than a human could. So to me, one of the, future sort of, you know, holy grail points of uh, that speak for autonomous vehicles is that 
you know, your sensors can fuse much more quickly. And, and whereas, you know, maybe the human couldn't get it out of that particular driving posture so quickly, the computer, by knowing um, which way it's heading, you got a gyroscope and MU, so compass and gyroscope, so you can tell your roll, pitch, yaw. And if you want to, you know, in the air, come down on a four, you can affect that. If you want to come down on two, front, back, whatever you, you know, is right for the situation, that's, that's where you can kind of start to demonstrate that more so, I think, in the off-road than an on-road uh, one-tenth scale situation. Okay, thanks, David. I have one last question, if, or another question. Sure. Uh, uh, so when you are buying a four to $600 entry level car, I'm thinking it's somewhat mature, but I'm also wondering how easy, how likely are you to get into trouble by setting some parameters wrong and having it, you know, hurt itself or well, things? Here. Yeah, I can show a couple of videos here where it didn't work, you know, where it went flying straight and it was supposed to turn and so on and so forth. Um, it, you can set the speed slow so you can, you can, you know, either physically catch it or what I'll do is it kind of, if, as soon as I see it starting to go nuts, I'll flip it back into manual control, put the brakes ah. down. But certainly now with this one where we're looking for more high speed activity, there was just no way to keep the um, the camera tucked back, like and and see enough of the road in front of you. So I actually stole some parts from my son's erector erector set and just made a kind of a metallic cover here to keep this camera a little bit more safe. Because if you can see from the as you can see from the top here, this car has been skidding forty yards down the pavement several times already. <laughs> <laughs> but you're to, still doing some risk management it seems big time big time you know and that's all kind of part of the fun and, and the learning but um you, you, it's a great point because uh you know the you don't want it destroyed every time and you can certainly get in like there's a lot of used rc cars out there and all that stuff too and even inexpensive chassis too if you don't if you're not worried about performance you know, there's some pretty inexpensive chassis you can use. Thanks. Any last questions, anyone? Dan, I would just close out. That I don't see, like, I haven't been paying attention to the chat. So to pick up, like, Manzor's name or anybody else that left an email, can I do it? Is the chat in the um, in the recording, too? Um, it should be in the recording. Um, yeah, we'll stop. Yeah, we can go ahead and stop recording. And then uh, as soon as you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to see the chat pretty easy as well. And then, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to head on the not necessarily job hunting as such, but I do consulting work. If anybody's thinking about bots or mobile solutions or anything like that, or, or got a job in that arena, autonomous or otherwise, don't I mean, definitely reach out. So I will stop sharing now. Thanks so much, David. I think it was a really great survey of uh, yeah, autonomous RC racing. I learned a lot. So thanks so much for giving the presentation. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. It's a great group. Oh, yeah. And if there's any Python programmers, by the way, in there that wants to get involved, one last thing. Yeah, I should add, be remiss if I forgot about that. So these things, like I said, are all you know, hundreds and hundreds. And that's still a high barrier to entry, maybe not for a university with grants, but for individuals. And the big community out there, the garage hackers and makers and all this stuff are the guys that are driving this stuff. It's incredible where even with the vision algorithms and, and, and really cutting edge stuff, you know, there's one guy in France, an 18 year old uh, programmer in France, who's just amazing. But the point being, what we want to do now is take this and get it down to this scale, which is one, a 128 scale car. And this is basically just vision based, but instead of having the nano on board in this case, it's off board and you're wirelessly communicating through a first person view. Where we're stuck or where I'm stuck a little bit is we need to send the throttle and steering commands that come from Jet Racer and currently just go to these IO pins. They need to go out to a USB port. 
which I think is not that complex a thing. It's been done. But if anybody wants to do a little look, investigate this Python code more, you know, in detail with us and help enable this 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 sort of thing, which would be probably under two hundred dollars, maybe even around one hundred and fifty. Um, you know, that would be cool. Much appreciated. Reach out. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, David.